Our first speaker, Professor Trishantha Nanyakare. Thank you very much for this opportunity to join you, uh, at least virtually, uh, from London. Um, it is, it is a great honor to be talking to uh, this August gathering. Um, so I'll be briefly touching on um, some of my experience in the technology-based education uh, sector uh, in, in several countries. Um, so as I <clears throat> kindly was given the introduction, I'm Professor Trinant Nanyakar and Director of MOF Lab in Imperial College London. You can see more details of what I'm doing in this website. Uh, just to give, uh, uh, I, I, my roots are in Goal, Sri Lanka. Uh, I, I went to uh, Richmond College Goal um, from grade one to grade 12 uh, uh, before going to the university. And uh, <clears throat> uh, luckily, uh, recently I found uh, some details of my roots in this microfiche a number of uh, notes of Reverend Benjamin Klo uh, in the uh, South Asian and Oriental and African studies. Uh, uh, school in London, so it's all documented my history. I was so proud to see that. Um, so the uh, most important objective of modern education is to produce problem solvers. So uh, it is not about knowledge, it is about your ability to solve problems. So what that means is uh, we the, the, the education system should produce people with positive attitude to see opportunities behind problems. Um, and then people who know how to see many facets of a problem, uh, you know, given, given, let's say, um, I mean, if I pick a random example, uh, in Sri Lanka, you may uh, experience that there are not enough coconut tree climbers to pluck coconut, right? So in the coconut industry is, placing, is facing that problem. So it is a problem, but there are many facets to that, right? So there's labor market problem uh, facet to that, and then socio-economic problem, technology fa face of that, political um, and international, you know, demand and supply market forces. So a professional who graduates from a university should be able to see the full spectrum of uh, the the faces of the same problem. I mean, you cannot kind of re trivialize it to a simple problem of <clears throat> lack of people to climb up trees to pluck coconut. Um, so, and then, uh, so you, we, we need people who know how to focus on their own expertise while collaborating with others with complementary skills. And then this comes from this ability to see many facets of the problem, understanding that my, my expertise is only one face of the problem and to solve the grand problem, I need to collaborate with other people with other expertise. Right? So finance, uh, economics, uh, sociology, uh, labor markets, uh, policy, government, international relations, like everything. Like I had to work with all these things. And then one mistake a lot of professionals do is that they think that my little, my little experience is the full picture of the problem. You cannot solve problems like that. Uh, so, um, and this is this is the objective of modern education, uh, and then this is what Imperial College London is uh, fully focusing on. Uh, okay, uh, so to give a brief introduction to Imperial College London, so we are home to seventeen thousand students and eighty eight thousand uh, staff. From uh, and our undergraduate students are coming from more than one hundred twenty five countries. Uh, right now, I think it is about one hundred thirty one countries. Uh, and out of that, uh, about 60% are coming from outside UK. Um, and then Imperial is, uh, it is home to the greatest concentration of impact research um, in any more, uh, major UK university. And then our staff has 40 Nobel, Nobel Prize winners and three uh, field medalists. Uh, field, field medalists is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for mathematics. Um, so our staff is blessed with that. Um, and then our, we are a global university, uh, so we are not just, uh, you know, focusing on UK. Uh, these are our partnership map. Uh, so we have 3,352 partners uh, in, in uh, Europe. Asia Pacific, we have 1,700, so like Middle East, Africa, South America and North America. So I think our biggest concentration is in Europe. North America and Asia Pacific uh, region. 
Uh, so these partnerships means like so the, we are joint research partnerships. We publish together. We commercialize output together. We launch companies together. Uh, and uh, every year, um, uh, I don't I don't know the exact count, but like it's like so we generate more than hundred uh, new tech companies every year uh, to to the global economy. Um, so this is how our funding is coming from. Uh, so research funding. So on average, we get in every year about uh, 400 million pounds of uh, research funding, uh, which is about 600 million dollars uh, every year. Uh, so this is uh, and this is a breakdown. Uh, so we get a substantial amount from the European Commission, um, and then then the next big chunk is coming from charities, like uh, charities like. Uh, you know, um, health healthcare charities and uh, social, uh, like, uh, you know, let's say Bill and uh, Melinda Gate Foundation uh, about, you know, vaccine development and that kind of uh, charity, charitable donations. So the government is, government and NHS is a small amount, but it is significant. And then we get the, a huge industry uh, funding about, uh, about 100 million pounds are coming from industry and other sources. Uh, so, uh, and then this is 21, uh, so we are just uh, just the first two quarters and then I think we will hit uh, 400 million again uh, total. Uh, so that's our kind of research budget. Uh, so Imperial Robotics Forum uh, um, is, has four robotics, uh, 44 robotics uh, labs. My lab is just one of them uh, out of the 44. Uh, so we are organized into bro four, three main groups like home robotics, healthcare robotics, and infrastructure robotics. Uh, and then we deal with industry partners separately. And then uh, at present, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the leader of the uh, robotics forum and my, uh, I'm assisted by our manager, uh, Dr. Anna Cross-Truis. And then, uh, we have we are spread in three faculties, eleven departments, and forty-four research groups. And then, our current research funding is about fifty million pounds. Uh, 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 the research budget, uh, current ongoing research funding. Um, so, we uh, we have broad partnerships with industries. Uh, we closely collaborate with uh, industry partners, and we invite. Um, you know, outside speakers, uh, for example, so this is uh, a two day workshop we did on future polarized labor markets, robots and economic policy reforms. We invite our, you know, government uh, representatives and then uh, this is uh, something I organized with uh, Tommaso. He's the head of Department of Economics and Public Policy in the business school. Uh, so we, you know, roboticists and business school people work together to solve grand problems. University of Cambridge, LSC, and then MIT, uh, Darren, Darren is uh, thought to be, you know, winning the economics Nobel Prize within the f next five years. Uh, that is what everybody believes. Uh, and then we invite these big companies, right, Google Health, uh, all these big, uh, you know, multi-billion companies to work with us and come with us and brainstorm. Uh, and then they voluntarily come to talk with us because we really yeah, focus on and United Nations, UNCTAD, and OECD countries. So this is the, just to give you an idea of how we solve problems, right? So we don't go like as individuals, we go as teams and big teams, and then with um, you know with a big uh, dream of solving grand problems in the in the world, uh, and then we have a correct understanding of our individual limitations and uh, to personally. I think I'm, I'm as a person, I'm, I'm leading uh, in everybody's forum, but as, a, as an individual, I'm kind of a speck of dust. Um, so uh, this is a kind of the broad process we are following uh, when we uh, solve a problem. Uh, first is you have to be grounded, right? So grounded in the, in the need, like, so you cannot think, oh yeah, I'm a professor of Imperial College, you know, get down and, you know, put your feet on the ground. That is the first thing you had to do, right? So you had to, you had to climb down from your ivory towers, forget that you are a professor of something or that, and then just, just get on with people, normal people, right? Talk to them. And then, 
so the first thing is uh, like you have to ask, you know, what is the ground level need, right? So let's say I pick a coconut, you know, problem. Uh, you know, talk to coconut growers first, right? So, and then just go there. Don't ask them to come to you. Like, just you go there and then, you know, go to the field and feel the temperature, feel the feel the humidity, feel the, you know, the mosquitoes, everything. Feel first. And then you have to ask the question, like, you know, who will pay for what, right? So, I'm, I want to solve this problem of coconut tree climbers, uh, lack of tree climbers. Okay, I mean, I can think of various solutions, right? So um, drones, uh, uh, robots that can climb trees or, you know, training animals, whatever, right? So then I had to ask a question, like, if I solve this problem, who is going to pay for me, right? So the pay for that a, a problem, like the coconut growers, right? And then do they have enough money to pay for the solution you are going to propose? It cannot be too expensive for them. And then a rough uh, guidance uh, is like, whatever we pr propose as a solution um, uh, should increase the income of our client, uh, the, our, our customer. So, and then we make uh, about one third of that incremental income to the grower, right? So to, the, to, the, to, the, to our beneficiary. So that two thirds of the profit, two thirds of the uh, benefit of our solution goes to the person who is paying us, right? So he becomes like uh, richer and then we become richer and then we, we sustain the relationship. And then we had to learn lessons from those who have already tried and failed, uh, look around and then don't, don't you know, you know pay, pay double, right? So just, just pay for what, what is just needed. And the lessons from things that are, they are already using, right? So they might be using various other alternative techniques and then just look around. Like I'm just speaking the coconut problem. This is not the only thing, right? So, but there can be other things like fishing, uh, you know, uh, Sri Lanka is a sunny country. You can, you can think about, you know, you, you have lots of vegetables uh, perishing uh, in vain in Dambulla. And then you can think about, you know, uh, sun dried vegetables that you can export to the whole world. Uh, so these are these are opportunities behind um, uh, problems you're facing, right? So, but think about it. And then you go to uh, you know, like you list down the critical problems you should be solving in that problem. So, is it the climbing the problem, the plucking the problem, or you know, uh, picking the problem or dropping the problem? <laughs> like, you know, what problem do you want to solve first? And then uh, you are not going to solve every problem, right? So you are going to list down all the things and then say, okay, so this critical bit, if I solve, uh, my, my client's income is going to grow by this much, right? Let's say a solution A is going to increase his income by uh, 10% and then solution B is going to increase his uh, income by 20%. I go for solution B because uh, the, my client gets a 20% increase in his income. And then my proportion, one third of that is also going to increase, right? And then we do a lot of ideation. Right? So prototyping is very important be before doing any prototyping, right? Prototyping is like, <clears throat> like even before a solution, you can make cardboard uh, solutions or paper solutions and then ask your client to feel it, you know, like they, they can say, oh, this is too big, this is too small this looks odd and then you know aesthetics are not right and everything so you don't spend a lot of money in that kind of wastage right so you just make out of paper or you just draw cartoons or draw you know things like this is called prototyping uh, alternative ideas and test with the real people right so just go to real people not just go to you know people in suits and ties in air conditioned rooms like get down to the ground and then talk to real people who will really pay this is why it is really important to understand who will pay for what, right? So talk to them, not to other people. And then prototype development and testing. These are, I mean, I've been writing loops because these are recursive things like you try and try and try uh, several times. And then beyond this, if you want to make impact, you have to, uh, you know, expand your pie. You have to talk to business people, marketing people, consultants, growth plans, you know, finance people, you know, tech people, your little expertise is, is going to be a speck of dust beyond this point if you really want to make impact, right? So a lot of people make this mistake. Oh, I'm an engineer. I did, I did uh, 10 years of research and then now 
this business guy you know marketing guy is coming and asking for 20% of the shares the truth is you cannot you cannot make a single cent without that guy you know you have to you have to talk to them and lawyers and you know true they are going to make money it, it is for a reason right so to push the next mile you need these people so we work together with um, all types of people to uh, fill the big picture right so and a correct humble understanding of what my limitations are uh, <clears throat> and then we go for um, go for the goal uh, we don't care about you know, who is going to benefit what and then uh, i'm i'm i care about solving the problem and then you know my share of uh, solving that problem that's all uh, i don't care about what other people are making out of that uh so just uh, one example uh, in i mean this is a british example don't don't worry too much about this right so we have a nhs congestion problem right so the lots of people go to hospitals and we have a limited number of hospitals and then there are patients who shouldn't be in the hospital sometimes like in the hospital and then you know taking the place of people who should be really treated very fast so our dream is somehow uh, you know project uh, the patient from home to the hospital so the way to do that is to uh, you know for example in the future if you have like a, a, a wearable jacket that can do electrical impedance tomography of your abdominal or chest cavity uh, uh, you know it's just uh, there's a quick wearable scanning and then project those parameters to a robotic uh, patient in the hospital right so basically you are you're projecting your body from your body to a robotic body in the hospital right so and then uh, so this is how we are making it so getting uh, inspiration from uh, you know this octopus like so you can see this octopus is camouflaging from what it is to a seaweed in the in the span of about a few seconds right so see like how it is camouflaging uh now now it is a seaweed right so some something like that so a robotic body can camouflage you uh, from the hospital uh, and then we are developing these organs uh, that can camouflage any organ condition like tumor fibrosis and uh, and we have internal sensors that can sense what is being you know examined and things like that so uh, this is called the robo patient project i'm leading this project with uh, collaborators from uh, hospitals uh, mainly from the radcliffe hospital of the oxford university and then bio inspired robotics lab at cambridge university and i'm i'm the principal investigator and which is uh, now uh, funded by uh, funded by the uk uh, engineering and physical research council which is about 1.8 million investment in this project uh so the the problem is like you know the robotic you can have a robotic patient but like you know the real people are like this right so they come from caucasian black uh, south asian far east asian backgrounds and then how do we camouflage all the facial conditions right so this is really important for uh, the robotic patient uh so for that we collaborate with uh, graphical you know artists and uh, psychologists and uh, you know facial expression experts um so this is uh, one example uh, so like you know we can camouflage a black male face uh, or uh, it can go to you know when you press on the abdomen it can express pains uh, but the robot can uh, ex- you know show the f- facial expressions of pain uh, and then it can go from a black face to a white uh, face uh, or a asian face so we we can so this is uh, led by uh, a sri lankan uh, postdoc in my lab tilina um, he, he came from us demurtu and then yunshan tang and civil uh, civil law is a civil is a undergraduate student so this is a, another example right so postdocs phd students and undergraduate students work in my lab uh, working together and then this is a civil exp- examining the robo her robo patient um uh so uh so we then we work with uh, real general practitioners in the hospitals right so and then we ask uh, get them to examine the very this is a prototype right so this is a, this doesn't look like a pro patient uh but we ask them to examine this and then give us feedback and then we continuously improve so you can see the same face is going through black uh um, a male uh, black female uh 
or uh, I think uh, you might see uh, white male, white female, uh, and South Asian, Asian. So the same face can camouflage uh, uh, different people right, from different backgrounds. This is super important uh, because our medical students, uh, all not all medical students have exposure to all ethnic groups uh, in, in, in UK and the world because like, so we are a, a global country, uh, you know, people from all countries live in London. Uh, and then we want to give a robust training to our medical students. And then what we find is that, you know, by giving a gender and ethnic neutral intervention, we can normalize their, their, their perception of pain uh, to a very uniform, robust perception. So within about 40 trials. So that is, that is what is important. So this green, green line you are seeing is the level of pain. So the, when they see that level of pain with the facial expression, so in, in your somatosensory cortex, you build a internal map from your diverse facial expressions to perception, a, a kind of a uniform perception. Uh, and then this way we uh, try to integrate this to uh, the medical curriculum of uh, the university. So, so this is some data um, you can see like, you know, before, before training, uh, so they have very diverse uh, perceptions of uh, their palpation forces are very diverse. And then during uh, intervention, like when you show that pain level, like so they kind of settle down to a uniform level. And if you go back to the original the facial expressions only, without that intervention, they are stabilized now, right? So they, 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 they feel it. So this uh, a uniform treatment to all ethnic groups is a very important thing. Uh, in the modern society. So this uh, universities are trying to solve that kind of problems uh, uh, together, right? Um, uh, so this is another extension of that, like, so we are extending it to augmented reality applications, like, so that we can teach medical students uh, across the globe. Uh, they don't have to have the robotic patients. So we, we extend it to augmented reality experience so that our medical professors and at Imperial, we can teach somebody in Hong Kong, for example, uh, it is just a matter of, you know, posting some a little bit of hardware and then you can still get them on our clinical uh, classes, uh, right? So this is, this, is, this is how we are progressing. Uh, then another, like a quick example of uh, what I did back in Sri Lanka when I was uh, in, I think 2001 to 2006, 2002 to 2006, uh, I, the problem I wanted to solve was uh, the landmine detection problem. Um, you know, up in the north, like, so we had about like four million some like landmines and these are the landmine explosion uh, points. And then the most victims were between 18 and 35 male uh, because they are farmers. And then when the, when the male gets injured, the female has bigger problems, uh, social problems, economic problems, you have to say. And the first thing we did was to go to the field, right? So this is me, uh, <laughs> the third person, and then these are my students, and then these, these are people. So just step into a landmine field and, you know, feel how your, how your legs are shaking uh, in, in that temperature, right? So we are just like him, right? So like, you know, this guy is wearing this uh, face shield and then this uh, body armor uh, to protect uh, if there's explosion, uh, you know, to protect the vital parts of the body, just wear it, right? You know, feel it, how heavy it is, how how sweating it is, like, you know, 34 ambient temperature and a, like more than 80% humidity, just feel it and then just have develop the empathy. Like I couldn't stand more than one hour there, right? So I was shaking, my, my legs were shaking, my whole body was sweating. And then just imagine that person doing that like about eight hours or nine hours, right? So that is the first ignition of, um, you know, empathy and uh, courage and motivation to solve the problem, right? So if you if you think I'm a professor, um, I, I will send my students to the field and then I will stay in University of Morotu and then, you know, just, just, just don't do that. Uh, so just get to the field first and then experience that. Um, and then look uh, for what, what other people are doing to solve the problem, right? So, uh, and then see how, how they are doing it. And then these are like, you know, different 
NGOs and military have, you know, this uh, Ronco, which is a State Department funded um, NGO. This is Humpty Dumpty, it's a New York based uh, uh, NGO, and then this, this Halo Trust. And then I saw that, like, you know, this, all these NGOs are solving about 20% of the problem. The Sri Lankan army was doing 80% of the demining, and they were a silent force, right? So, like, when, whenever you go uh, to the field, uh, most vocal people, you will see these most vocal people who are mostly NGOs, right? But the silent people who are really doing the bulk of the work, like the Sri Lankan army, they are silent. You don't, you, don't, you, you have to go to them and then talk to them, right? So um, otherwise they won't be seen. Uh, so you will, be, you will be seeing those people who are doing the marketing stuff, right? Uh, so we saw uh, the Sri Lankan army was, uh, you know, had their own techniques, like very, you know, I was wearing this shoe, it was about like 10 kilograms heavy, um, uh, like just to prevent, uh, you know, explosion from, you know, breaking your knees. Uh, so I was wearing this and then, you know, walking in the minefield and uh, behind uh, uh, Brigadier Ananda Chandasuri, that time the brigade commander of the engineers brigade. Uh, I really, you know, uh, had developed that empathy and then we, we, we continued to work and then we got bio inspiration from this iguana uh, and then we developed uh, robots out of junk, right? So I, I, I told my students, if this is Sri Lanka, we, we will not import uh, expensive stuff to make our robots. We will go to junkyards and then, you know, rescue material from broken car parts or bicycle spare parts. We, we made the first world's first recycled robot, right? That could really walk in a minefield, uh, in, a, in a forest environment. These so-called advanced robots you find in Japan, US, UK, Europe, none of them could walk in a, in a minefield. Right? So our rescued uh, junk robot <laughs> could, could walk. So this, this hit, hit international news, right? So uh, because these people in, from Sri Lanka were solving a problem that the entire world couldn't solve, right? So, and then we were training a local animal called mongoose to detect explosives. Uh, and then we were just guiding this mongoose uh, in uh, using this robot, the minefield. So this is what I call a prototype, right? So prototype is like, you know, just make uh, some, your, your idea, your vision out of paper cups and, you know, paper straws. Uh, and then get the inspiration from, you know, watching how animals walk in minefields without triggering mines, right? Uh, and then find a local animal who has a lot of olfaction capacity. Uh, and then, you know, this mongoose is much way better than a German shepherd dogs uh, who are imported for about $40,000, right? So uh, that's, that's really important. Then I, I went to um, Harvard University and then um, uh, in 2006, Harvard MIT, and then I was uh, continuing to work on the same things, uh, supported by a lot of other people. Um, so the point is like, so that led to a spin out company and uh, I met a Lahiru Jayatilaka, a Sri Lankan uh, student uh, whom I met at Harvard University. And then now he has his own company, uh, he sells, uh, mining equipment to U.S. Army Research Lab, U.S. Special Forces, uh, United uh, States Army, Europe, and Joint Improvised Threat Defeat Organization, um, again, uh, DOD. Uh, so you can check out uh, redlotus uh, redlotustech.com. Uh, this is, a, this is a, now a, a, you know, a big impact uh, coming out of Harvard University, uh, and then I'm so proud of this uh, final outcome. Uh, the commercial outcome, right? Uh, so, okay. So another uh, a, a simple thing is uh, the coconut growers, uh, like the problem I mentioned, like so there are about 40 farm species. With 10% of coconut production is lost and estimated loss is about 450 million. And then we, uh, we um, I'll skip some slides. Uh, we uh, developed a sensor, which is the best in the world. And then now that sensor is cloud connected uh, IoT solution. And then uh, we spun out a new company called Permia Sensing. Now we are marketing that in uh, different countries. Uh, so uh, to conclude, um, so we have uh, like, you know, examples like uh, these uh, student uh, companies, they, 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 they spin out 
Uh, the start company called Petit. Uh, so this is a this is a garment you can wear, and then when the child grows. You just can stretch it and then you know iron it and then you know uh, uh, make it uh, make it bigger when the grows and then this is another fresh tag. It's, it's like you know the tag has color coding, and then if the fish uh, gets kind of you know um, let's say you know you have these fake expiry dates and then it is it doesn't mean anything and then that leads to a lot of food waste. And then what this does is like, so it gives you a color code if it is safe to eat or not, right? So this is a concrete canvas. You have a just rolled canvas and then you put some water and then it becomes concrete, right? So like there, this master's course alone has spun out 61 companies uh, so far, right? So that is what like we are meaning by education, impact oriented education of students. So the conclude, um, what Sri Lanka can do is uh, you can do, you know, first thing you should do is like reward universities for being research active. Uh, get them to, you know, reward them for problem solving and focus on solving local problems in collaborative efforts and medics working with engineers, agriculture people working with other people and things like that. And find ways to add value to local resources, right? And then encourage local and international collaborations to uh, solve grand problems. So with that, uh, I will um, stop my talk and uh, I can take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nanya Kara, for your very insightful and exciting presentation that you shared with us and for your expert views.